Hello, everyone, and welcome back. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of how we can use definite integrals to evaluate geometric quantities. Now, if you go all the way back to where we started with this, we were interested in originally finding the area underneath a curve. And we use this to sort of create an abstract notion of area bounded between the x-axis and a given curve. And then we extended this concept to show how we can use it to compute volume of three-dimensional objects and how we can find the arc length of a given one-dimensional curve. In this lecture, we're going to consider another geometric quantity that can be evaluated using these definite integrals. And that is surface area. And much like what we talked about with volumes, we're going to specifically focus on the surface area of solids of revolution. So let's jump right in. We are going to build ourselves up. So we're not going to just immediately talk about a curve and revolving it around a certain axis. Let's start simple. And in particular, what I want to do to start simple is I want to imagine that you're just given a straight line segment that is parallel to the x axis. And you're asked to revolve this thing around, say, the x-axis. So here is, the, here is what you're, you're asked to do. You want to take this thing around like this. Now, in this case, we're not interested in the area underneath this curve or the area of, of this, this line to the, um, to the x-axis. That would result in a full filled-in cylinder. What we are interested in is taking that one-dimensional line and sort of tracing out a hollowed out cylinder, right? So this would be a cylindrical shell. You could think of this as uh, if you're jumping rope, you're skipping. Uh, you can imagine that the rope, it leaves a sort of vapor trail and traces out just this solid shell. And you are in the middle of this object, you're still able to sort of move around freely. So then the question is, if we take this thing and we extend it, like this, we get these cylindrical shells and we ask ourselves, what are the areas of these cylindrical shells? So as you can probably imagine, we're going to be interested in when this length of this line segment is small. So let's say the height of this cylindrical shell is delta x. And this thing is this, line segment, again, it's a constant uh, curve. So the y value is fixed. Let's just call that y for the sake of this. Then if we sort of unwind this thing, what we can see is that this can be interpreted as a rectangle where the same process is happening that we were doing with cylindrical shells where we sort of just cut this thing and unwind it and lay it flat. And what we just said is that this length here is delta x. And that tells us that the, the green length, the height of this thing, is equal to the circumference of this object. And so we can see that the, the radius here is given by the distance from the center, the x-axis, up to uh, the line here at y. So this length here is given by y. So the radius is exactly the y value. This tells us that the length of this rectangle or the height of this rectangle is the circumference, which is two pi y. So that tells us that the surface area is equal to two pi y times delta x. And as you can imagine, this is going to be how we're going to build up to a more complex object. But before I get there, before I build myself up to an even more complex object, let me just think about a line that is on an angle. So I just looked at a horizontal line. This thing is perpendicular, or it's parallel, sorry, to the x-axis. 
let's just ask ourselves what happens if we deal with a line that might have a little bit of an incline or a decline to it. So then, here's my line. In this case, I want to rotate this line segment, sorry, around the x-axis. So I will spare you me trying to trace out uh, this object. But what I want to emphasize is that this is going to look like a cone where you cut off the top of it. And that cut off from the top is coming from this endpoint right here. And you can think of this as being the circular base of this cone. So the question is, what is the surface area of this truncated cone or this lopped off cone? Well, again, uh, we're going to consider a height for this thing to be delta x. So it's just that delta x doesn't necessarily have to be small. It's just representing a change in x. Then what we can say is that the length of this line segment is going to be uh, let's call it L. So let's say the line segment itself has length L. And in this case, you know, we can use the Pythagorean theorem to say that L is actually equal to, say, the square or the delta x squared. That's this length down here. And then if we if we'd like to call this delta y, the change in y. So how much we've gone up or down in y from one end of this to the other. Again, we can use the Pythagorean theorem here to tell us that the length of this segment is given in terms of delta x and delta y. OK, so uh, just like I did before, let me unravel this object. So I get maybe something that looks like this, roughly. Um, let's make this green. And here now, I've got this trapezoid. And now I have a length L running along the bottom. The question is, how do I calculate the area of this thing? Well, the way that you do this is you find the midpoint of these angled sides. And then what you do is you calculate that height. So in this case, the height here is again going to be a circumference. Remember, this is a uh, this is when you take this uh, picture right off the board and you wrap it up so that the red lines touch each other. Now you have your three-dimensional object. So all I've done is sort of cut down one side and flatten it out. But when you have the three-dimensional object, you put a slice right down the middle of that thing. This blue line is going to be a circle when I wrap it all back up again. So that means that the length of this blue line is going to be a circumference. And it's actually going to be given by, sorry, two pi, right? That's coming from the circumference formula. And then times, so if we, uh, if we can see that my picture has been um, uh, rotated slightly. And so in this case, we have to ask ourselves, what is the radius here? And the radius is going to be the distance from the x-axis up to the midpoint of this, this curve. So it'll be right here. So this is right in the middle it's it's delta y over 2 away from each of the the points or uh, each of the endpoints here so let's call this like uh let's call it y star just to give it a name so that i don't have to keep uh, writing down exactly its formula but i'm going to say this is y star and if you would like me to be precise about this um y star is actually by definition the midpoint of y1 plus y2 over 2, where I'm defining the endpoint of this curve to be x2, y2, 
and the initial point of this curve to be x1, y1. So I know that the curve is getting very cluttered here, so I don't want to add too much more. But that tells me that the surface area of this thing Well, now it's a very, very similar formula. This is two pi y star times L. So now I've got a, a formula for these little trapezoids. And this is how I'm going to build up a Riemann sum in order to create or to, to take the limit as delta x goes to zero in order to find the surface area of a solid of revolution. So let me uh, let me start fresh on another page because we're going to have another uh, artistic rendering to work with. So let me imagine now I give you a very general curve. So let's say it looks like this. Starts at one point. Maybe I give you a curve that looks like this. And I ask you to revolve that thing around the x-axis. I ask you, what is the surface area of this new curve now? Well, the way that we're going to approximate this is exactly the same as what we've been doing all along. So if the initial point here says A, I'm going to make this purposely large so that we can uh, just sort of illustrate the point. Of course, we would want the distance between each of these xk's to be small. And of course, that's what happens in the limit. But for illustration's purpose, purposes only, we have the initial point, and let's go up to x1 here. So this is f of x1. And then let's go over to the next point, x2. This is f of x2. And then the next point, this is f of x3, and so on and so forth. And we are going to consider shapes just like the previous example. So it, it is, we're going to approximate this thing by joining a line segment from f at a, which I forgot to label, f at a over to f at x1, and then f of x1 over to f of x2, and f of x2 over to f of x3, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's, this is exactly the same process that we used for the arc length calculation. And as you can imagine, this is actually going to be slightly similar. Um, so the question is, uh, what is the surface area of each one of these line segments rotated around? Well, that's the formula that I just gave you, right? So if we denote, say, delta yk, this is going to be given by f of xk minus f of xk minus 1. Then the length of each line segment, so let's say this is L1, this is L2, this is L3, and so on and so forth. The length of each one of these slants is going to be given by, again, just from the Pythagorean theorem for what I drew on the previous uh, slide or the previous page, we get this formula right here. And we remember that in order to compute the area of each one of the surface area of each one of these uh, angled lines as it's rotated around, we need the midpoint of each one of these um, each one of these line segments. And so this tells me that y star, again, this thing depends on k, but I don't want to make the notation too ugly. This is given by the left endpoint in y plus the right endpoint in y all divided by two right that's just an average right if i got 50 percent on my first test and i got 100 percent on my second test then my average over two tests is 75 percent the midpoint of both of those things so that tells me 
that the area of the, the sort of truncated cone uh, rotated around this X axis, the surface area of this thing can be used or can be found using the formula from the previous board. Now, these, these uh, truncated cones, they have a special name because they're so important in mathematics. Uh, we call them a, a thrust hum. So I'm going to adopt this convention just so that I don't have to say truncated cone anymore. It's just a lot of words. Um, so also, uh, frustum is a word that I have read many times and have never said out loud. So it is possible that I am I am mispronouncing it. So I apologize to everyone on that. Um, the surface area, SA, okay? This is given by two pi times y star times LK, which we get two pi times f of xk minus one plus f of xk divided by two, and then multiplied by this Pythagorean component here. And we can simplify a little bit, not a whole lot, but those twos get knocked off each other on front. So we might as well make it a little prettier for ourselves since the formula is a little ugly. Um, F of X, K. And we got Delta X squared plus Delta Y, K squared. Okay, so now, we have a discrete approximation of the surface area of the solid of revolution, right? So SA of solid of revolution, okay? So again, some, some short forms, but I just don't wanna bog us down in, in me just writing over and over again. This is approximately equal to the sum of all of these, uh, the surface areas of all of these frustums or frustums. Okay, so we get pi and then f of xk minus one. So I'm basically just going to rewrite the formula that's right above this thing. And so of course, we this, this is starting to look like a Riemann sum. It's not quite there, uh, but we want to let delta x go to zero, right? And we, that's equivalent to letting n go to infinity as long as uh, these things are equally spaced. And, and we've seen this a few times now, right? We, we're getting pretty good at this. Um, this will arrive us at a, uh, a nice definite integral. So the question is, you know, what do we do? Well, if you were paying attention in the previous lecture, this is very, very similar to what we did with arc length. So we're gonna use the mean value theorem in order to uh, get delta yk in terms of delta x. So the same thing that we did previously from the mean value theorem, mvt. So we used that expression last time. This is the differential mean value theorem. We know that delta yk, which is the same as f of xk, minus f of xk minus one. This is equal to f prime of ck times delta x, where ck belongs to the interval xk minus one to xk. So somewhere in between those two points, uh, we can approximate the secant line, or we can get exactly the slope of the secant uh, in terms of the derivative. But this is good, right? Because this helps us a lot with how we uh, can simplify this thing. So this tells me that the area of each one of these uh, frustums goes k minus one plus f of xk, and then the square root of delta x squared plus delta yk squared well, we do the same manipulation that we did for the arc length formula, and this comes out to be pi f of xk minus one plus f of xk. And then we can factor out a delta x from this thing 
uh, again, just see the arc length computation here. We get one plus F prime of CK squared delta X. And so that means that the surface area of the solid of res revolution, this is what happens when we let delta X go to zero, the number of points go to infinity. We've seen this again with the, the previous video with the, the arc length, F prime of CK, that gives us an F of X in there. Similarly, F of XK minus one and F of XK, those are becoming the same point. Why? F is a continuous function. So that was an implicit inception here. Actually, we're taking a derivative, so we need this thing to be smooth. And also, XK minus one and XK, they're getting squished together in this limit. So this tells us that that discrete summation is going to converge to something that looks like this. You get a pi, you get f of x plus f of x. So I get my two back out front here, two f of x, and then the square root of one plus f prime of x squared dx. Okay, so do, do we see where that came from? The two came from the fact that you have f of x k minus one plus f of x k. Those things are becoming the same point. And so essentially what you can see here is this is just the same computation that I had previously uh, in terms of uh, the, the sort of um, the frustums, which I know that I'm mispronouncing. But it's the same idea. The only thing here is now that you're taking infinitely small slices in X as well. But we can summarize this whole thing uh, with the following definition. So definition. So we have, if the function which we will implicitly, well, explicitly assume is non-negative so that we can actually revolve this thing around the x-axis. So if this thing is continuously differentiable, smooth, Uh, on a b the and I'll emphasize this with a little bit of color the area of the surface obtained by revolving uh, the graph y equal to f of x uh, about the x-axis is exactly, uh, so this sa, I like to use sa for surface area. This is the definite integral of a to b of two pi f of x and then the square root of one plus f prime of x squared dx. So it looks very similar to the surface area for, uh, formula. And that came from the fact that we have a very similar derivation to the surface area formula, right? We sort of discretize this curve by using these uh, straight line approximations. And we let the distance between those, or the, yeah, the distance between the, the points used to find these straight lines go to zero and boom, we arrive at this continuous curve again. All right, let me give you an example just so we can sort of drive this home so we can really see you know, how to put this formula into use. So I think it's important, let's, uh, let's start completely fresh here. So let me start over. So example, find the area. of the surface, and this is generated by revolving the curve uh, 
y equal to the square root of x. Uh, let's put a two in front there. You'll see why. This will just simplify some stuff for us. Uh, over this interval, one is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to two about the x-axis. Okay, so we got another square root function. Uh, remember in the previous video, I said I really like square roots because it seems to be the only thing that my iPad allows me to draw in a semi nice way. So this is y is equal to two root x. And our bounds here, let's say this is one. And let's say this is two. So we can see that there's this little line segment. This thing is going to trace out uh, a nice sort of uh, object that's going to look like the top of a circular cone almost, uh, but it's just going to be lopped off again. And that lopping off is going to come from the x equal to one cutoff. So now we've got a formula, right? If I go back, I've got a formula for this. The only thing that really needs to be done is start plugging in uh, the effective pieces that I need, right? So I need A and B. I need to identify what the function is and I need to identify its derivative. Then I am at this point where I can just start computing uh, a definite integral. So let's tabulate everything we know. First of all, A is equal to one. B is equal to two. Uh, the function, so f of x, maybe y is equal to f of x, is equal to 2 root x. And uh, f prime of x, this thing is equal to 1 over the square root of x, which can equivalently be written as x to the minus 1 half. So just like what we did uh, in the previous lecture, I'm going to simplify that square root first because it's going to get a little ugly if we don't. So this tells me that the square root of one plus the derivative squared, this is going to be square root of one plus x to the minus one half squared, which is equal to the square root of one plus one over x, that's x to the minus one. Let's simplify it a little bit. Let's turn this all into one big fraction. So I get x plus one divided by x. That's because the one turns into an x over x term. And let's distribute that square root over the top and the bottom. And why did I do that? Well, you can see that the square root of x on the bottom is going to cancel with this f of x term when we put it all into the surface area computation. Sorry about that. So. Therefore, the surface area now is given by the integral from one to two. And let's start putting in what we know, two pi and then times two root x. And then multiplied by the square root of x plus one divided by the square root of x dx. So I recognize that I did that all in one step. So let's mention that this is our f of x term. Uh, maybe just in a different color. This is equal to the square root of one plus the derivative squared. So I have all of the ingredients now. I just need to start making it look pretty so that I can get to a point where I can, uh, where I can do some work on this thing. So I've got four pi, that's a constant that floats out front. And the square root of x's are going to cancel each other. So I'm left with the square root of x plus one dx. You can find the antiderivative of this thing using the substitution rule if you'd like. Uh, go ahead, pause the video, go ahead and do that to see if you can, if you can meet me and get the right answer. Uh, but for those that didn't pause the video, let's go ahead. So we have the antiderivative of this thing is given by, uh, this is gonna be two over three, x plus one to the three over two. And this is running from one to two. And the numbers, they don't work out very nicely. We're gonna keep them as radicals uh, just so that they're exact. 
So we can absorb all, all of these pieces here. Uh, we get eight pi over three, and then three root three uh, minus two root two. So nothing too exciting. Uh, it's just some really sort of nasty, ugly numbers, uh, but they are numbers nonetheless. But that's it, right? If you think about this, it's, it's beautifully simple, right? Now we spent the, the beginning of the lecture deriving the formula, but once we have the formula, just like with arc length, things are fairly easy. The examples aren't that strenuous on us. So the last thing that I wanna do in this is I wanna mention that you don't have to just uh, rotate around the x-axis. You could rotate around the y-axis instead. So let's say revolving uh, around the y-axis. Well, in this case, Everything really becomes exactly the same. Um, you can rederive it. If you can go back to the beginning of this video and try and pose everything in terms of y or revolve around the y-axis, and you'll see that everything becomes exactly the same. It's just like the cylindrical shells, right? They all uh, they can either be put horizontal or they can be put vertical. But the only the only thing that matters in our case is the surface area, and the surface area doesn't care about the orientation of these things. So let me just summarize the result here and we'll do an example to drive it home. So if we're able to write X as a function of Y, so an inverse function potentially, uh, and we're going to assume this thing is positive or non-negative, if this is continuously differentiable, on some CD, so this is gonna be very similar to arc length as well. The, again, this deserves some emphasis. So the area uh, of the surface uh, that is generated by revolving the graph uh, x equal to g of y about the y-axis is, now it's basically the same formula, just with the y's written in here. So this is the integral from c to d of two pi g of y, and then the square root of one plus g prime of y all squared dy, right? So, so this shouldn't be very surprising. This is very similar to what we talked about when it came to uh, arc length as well. So let's just, uh, let's go ahead and actually write down an example because that's really where our, our understanding is gonna come from, right? With calculus, you just have to do lots and lots of examples, see all different types of problems uh, to, to understand exactly how things are working. So let's say example two for this lecture, uh, the line segment X is equal to uh, one minus Y where Y runs between zero and one is revolved around the y-axis to generate uh, the cone or to generate a cone, right? It's not the cone. To generate a cone, which I'll show you in, in an image. And so find its surface area. Okay, so let me uh, let me offer up a sketch. So here's my line. And it is going to be revolved like this. My line is given by 
x is equal to one minus y. So x is already a function of y for me. Life is good. Uh, and in fact, this is y is equal to one. Here's y is equal to zero. So I really have most of the information that I need already, right? I've got c is equal to zero, d is equal to one, x equal to g of y is equal to one minus y, and g prime of y, well, this is a linear function, so I have a constant derivative of minus one. So really, this tells me that the square root of one plus the derivative of y or g of y squared, this is equal to one plus minus one squared, which is just a constant. It's equal to the square root of two. So now I can just start putting this into the nice formula. Sa is equal to the integral from zero to one of two pi, and then I get one minus y, and then times the square root of two dy. And again, maybe it's worth emphasizing what each one of these terms are. This is g of y, and this is the square root of one plus the derivative of y squared. Now you can see that this integral is not going to be too bad, right? If we clean this up a little bit, I get two root two pi. So I pull all the constants down front. I don't really care what they are. One minus y dy. Now a nice linear function. I can find the antiderivative of it. It's going to be quadratic. So this leaves me with two root two pi and then y minus y squared over two, all running from zero to one. And now calculator problem, life is good, right? We plug in the upper bound, we subtract it from the lower bound. We've done this over and over and over and over again. Uh, the solution here is actually root two pi. So the hard part is getting us to a point where we can apply the formula. In this case, the formula is the definite integral so we have a little bit of thinking to do when it comes to finding any derivatives. But honestly, the, the most difficult part of this problem is typically just identifying all the components and simplifying things to a point where the definite integral can be evaluated uh, using you know, just the knowledge that we've built up over all of these examples that we've been talking about. The other thing that I want to, uh, to emphasize or close by emphasizing is uh, you can actually calculate this using the old geometry sort of rules that you were maybe taught in grade school, right? So when this video finishes, you've got your computer open, you're watching it on your computer, search up what the, the surface area of a cone is. And when you search up the surface area of a cone, find the relevant information for the cone right here and make sure it syncs up with our solution. Our solution was the square root of two pi. So you have a sort of sanity check, but also now you know where that formula came from, right? That formula came from calculus, from finding these, uh, these surface areas using these surfaces of revolution. Okay, thank you very much. I'll see you for the next video.